Good afternoon to our webinar today, Beyond Promotions, Career Development Strategies that Foster Employee Growth. We have quite a few people who've registered today, so we're going to give them about 30 seconds to get into the webinar. Um, while we're doing that, I always like to know where people are calling in from, so if you wouldn't mind putting that in the chat, that would be really helpful. I'm a little bit of a geography geek. I see lots of North Carolina, US, Pennsylvania, Ireland popped up there, Canada. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome. My name is Deborah Turner Bailey. I'm the Chief People Officer at WFAE, which is an NPR station in Charlotte, North Carolina. I am also a Bravely coach and trainer and facilitator, and I'm going to act as our moderator for today's panel. Thank you so much for participating. Our topic today is Beyond Promotions. How do we provide career development and employee growth uh, when promotions may not be an option or the best option? So we have three great panelists with us today, uh, Carmen, Mark, and Gia. So I'm going to give them an opportunity to introduce themselves, Carmen. Thank you, Deborah. Well, it's delightful to be here today. So thank you for having me. Um, I'm very excited to talk about this topic today. Um, but yes, I am an organizational and business psychologist uh, with international experience in engagement, org design, leadership, performance and development, um, emotional intelligence, and lots of kind of that individual psychology side of things, um, as well as DEI. Um, but right now, what I do is I am the community lead of the Oyster People Builders community. And uh, what we do in that community is we regularly empower and facilitate leaders and professionals across the world globally to transform their workplaces into authentic, inclusive, and thriving remote and hybrid environments. Um, as of where I am, I am in Barcelona, Spain. So it's uh, the end of the day for me. The sunset will probably be coming down behind me very, very soon. Um, but thank you for having me. Thank you, Carmen. And Gia. Perfect. Hello, everyone. I am Gia DeMichael. I am currently a people scientist at Culture Amp, which means that I get to do all things people, data, engagement. Uh, my background is in organizational psychology. I have both my master's and PhD in that. And prior to working at Culture Amp, I spent seven years in healthcare leading really large scale culture change efforts, specializing in safety culture specifically for anyone who's into that really niche space of, of healthcare. Uh, and excited to be here today to talk a lot more about how we can offer those great development opportunities that maybe aren't quite those traditional promotion opportunities. And she is calling in from? I am calling in from Phoenix, Arizona. It's quite toasty here. <laughs> Thank you. And Mark, how about you? Yeah, thanks. Hello, everyone. So nice to see you all. Uh, Mark calling in from the suburbs of Chicago, as I'm sure you can all tell by my background. It looks like Oregon or something, but uh, just uh, western of, uh, of Chicago. Um, so Mark Turner, uh, I'm one of our Bravely Coaches. Um, I have a history of sales leadership. Uh, I was a sales leader for about 10 years. I uh, moved myself into an enablement leadership role. So for the, the last almost 10 years, I've been, uh, I, I work on the side with LinkedIn. I developed some of our um, inspirational and emerging leader programs. I also champion manager onboarding initiatives. So uh, more career transformation moments while also uh, being an executive coach and coaching sales leaders specifically uh, as they continue to progress. Um, obviously within that scale, one of one topic that I'm extremely passionate about is how we think about inspiring that next wave of leaders, um, especially when the, uh, the list of leadership opportunities over the last several years certainly has shrunk, right? So how do we keep people motivated? Something I'm super excited to talk about. So thank you for having me and uh, excited to dive in. Thanks, Mark. 
Um, let's launch a poll just to find out what are the challenges that you're facing as you think about this topic of promotions. So you've got a few choices there. Um, select the challenge you're facing in providing promotional opportunities within your organization. There's a race between number one and number three. <laughs> So it looks like uh, this, um, the fact that we are having flatter organizations, not as many levels or maybe functions. And so there are not as many promotional opportunities as before. And also really unclear uh, career paths. And there could be certainly many reasons for that. Uh, but then we also had a strong third with individual contributors not being ready to be people leaders. So um, thank you. We can stop sharing that poll and we're gonna jump right in. Often employees think about um, promotion as the um, hallmark of progress or growth and learning. And so we want to explore today um, what kinds of strategies uh, might we have, or what might be some reasons that promotion isn't right or isn't the right way to grow and develop uh, employees? And so I'm going to ask Gia and then Mark to kick us off with their thoughts about that. Perfect. One of the first things that comes to mind to me with employees maybe not being the right fit for a promotion, or quite frankly, sometimes that promotion not existing in an organization is all about how we've structured the organization. For many individual contributors, the only promotion option available to them is a people leader role, which technically our greatest individual contributors aren't our greatest people leaders. Like we, we have some overlap between the two skills. There are some individual contributors who can develop and become really great people leaders, but so many individual contributors would rather have a promotion available to them that accelerates that pathway of how can I get to be better and more expertise in my specific skill set where I'm still doing the work that I love so much, while maybe the person who's not as great at the job on the daily basis is actually our really best people leader because they have that skill set figured out. So that's one of the first things that comes to mind to me when we think about that gap between someone being ready to be promoted and whether or not there's a good fit between the person and the role. It's not always that we're just failing our people and getting them into those leadership roles. It's sometimes that we don't offer an alternative pathway and the only way to grow in the organization is through those people leader promotions. That's a really uh, big nugget there though. Go ahead, Deborah. <laughs> no, no, thank you. And I think it is one that most organizations face. Uh, Mark, what would you add to that? I mean, I, I would, uh, I'll plus one, I'll probably plus one many comments. I mean, it's very well spoken by Gia. I think the people leadership thing is very much, um, sadly, a dead end for for a lot of people. It becomes like this natural, like, uh, psychological thing. Like, okay, if I'm good at this, I will then be good at leading people in this. And I mean, all of us know that there is so much data that shows the highest performer performing individual contributors, like a vast majority of them are not going to be great people leaders. So like the the linear connection there, I, I think is disconnected. I know I sort of just repeated what Gia said. Um, one of the big things for me is organizational setup and mindset when it comes to stuff like this. Um, in many companies, there, when it comes to like career pathing uh, from a development of skills and an understanding of like expectations for performance is oftentimes um, like disconnected or misleading. And what I mean by that is, when people do a really good job and they look at their, like, let's say biannual or annual performance review, they expect and exceeds expectations or far exceeds or whatever your, whatever your scale is at your company. Like they're like, wow, I did a great job. I should be showed that I did a quote unquote great job by above and beyond. When the reality is when culturally set properly meet expectations should be a, a challenging, hard thing to achieve. Like our expectations of you when we hired you in 
is that you were going to be an amazing employee. We have very high expectations. And for you to meet them should be like an extremely, uh, something we should celebrate. For you to exceed or far exceeds, like that should be like, wow, what's your impact 10X or how have you scaled it across? Like it should be a, a real nominal thing. Um, and I feel like over the years that that sort of has slipped. People will view a meets expectation as like a disappointing uh, review. And I think most of the time that's set up culturally, right? If I hire you in, I should say, look, progression to promotion. Here's your three-year path. Here are the skills that I want you to grow. Here's how we're going to monitor that. Here are the expectations. Here are examples of people that have progressed this. If you do well here in two years, maybe you can stretch to something else. So having that set up can eliminate the expectation of, and like the dissatisfaction of, oh man, I only met expectations. Like I would hate for that to be the way people receive it. And I think oftentimes within this topic, that's the way it happens. I hope I said that properly, but I hope that yeah. makes sense. Thank you, Gia and Mark. Uh, good comments about structure of the organization and how we set expectations with employees. Carmen, I was wondering if you would speak to what are some challenges that HR professionals face when um, promotion isn't right and there are other ways that you want to grow and develop employees? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, as Gia and Mark have said, I think a lot of employees often really equate career development with promotions. That's kind of the go-to mindset. And so that could mean that when we start to introduce you know, non-promotion based strategies or start to talk about different ways of growing ourselves. Um, it could be interpreted as us as a company limiting their growth and limiting their, you know, upward mobility as well. Um, and I think sometimes what we find as a challenge is people might be resisting this non-traditional development um, and they kind of might be pushing for this promotion based path, um, especially if this is something that they have been expecting. Uh, maybe that was agreed in uh, some form of some form of kind of psychological contract ahead of time as well, maybe with their manager when they started the role, um, or maybe just something that they expect from from the get go. Um, but I think another challenge is also the managers, right? So it could be that uh, the employee is interested in non promotion based strategies, but are managers equipped and have the, do they have the skills or motivation to actually support these strategies, right? And looking at it, promotion or growth in a different way. Um, and I also think another challenge is around, you know, how do we actually measure that, right? With the promotion, it's very measurable. It's a specific level. It's a specific increase in salary, et cetera, or a different competencies. But when we start to uh, open our view of what non-promotion-based strategies are, you know, maybe learning a new skill, how do we actually start to measure that? And so that can be also complicated in terms of how we how we implement that in a in a business. Um, but yeah, those are some, some challenges that I can think of. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Well, let's uh, let's explore some strategies that you've utilized or that you're familiar with for non-promotion based growth and development. Uh, so maybe just a couple of examples. And Mark, we're going to start with you on this one. Absolutely. So. <laughs> I think there's a lot of different things that you can explore when it comes to like tactical strategies. I think it's important, like step one, I think it's important to remember that people are employees of companies because it's a job and they want to be paid. Like foundationally, like I'm here, like no one, there's not many people that are working for free. I know there's the cliche, like, you know, if you love what you do, you, you never work a day in your life or whatever that is. Like, look, we're all, we're all here because there's a paycheck and it, it, and it helps our livelihood. Um, but oftentimes there's that psychological connection that Carmen sort of nailed to like, you know, promotion equals my personal success, right? And that's where people sort of, they connect that. So if I'm not getting a promotion, then am I really being successful here? And I would argue that if culturally set up properly, promotion can be disconnected from opportunities to grow. Or I saw a comment in the chat about competency models. Like, can I grow a skill? Like we at LinkedIn, we were very knee deep into competency. I know in Bravely, we invest a lot in the coaching people to developing competencies. Um, but that has to be set up on the front end. And then I think about what are the opportunities that will actually allow people to do this? So let's take uh, Gia's call out from the first question, people leadership, right? So I've identified, let's say Gia's raised her hand and said, you know what? I might want to explore a people leadership role in the future. 
and I'm her manager. And I'm like, well, look, over the last three years, we all know how the cycle has gone. There's less and less. Companies aren't really growing vertically as quickly as they were before the pandemic. But I do think you have a high potential. You've obviously been an amazing individual contributor. Um, in lieu of a flood of open roles, what are some things that we can do to help you maybe be the obvious choice one day when a role does come available? So then I need to start to think about what are those things? Um, some companies are very good at setting up emerging leader type programs. Like I'm going to I'm going to select Gia because she's in my uh, my short list of potential future promotions. And maybe there's 30 other people across the company and we're going to bring them in for monthly workshops and we'll talk about certain skills leaders need to apply. So like formulaically, if a company does that, that's a phenomenal avenue. If that doesn't exist, me as a leader, I'm starting to think about, can Gia shadow me on some stuff? Gia, do you want to lead one team meeting a quarter? Uh, I have a forecasting call from a sales leader. Would you like to shadow me? And can I even ask my director if maybe you can lead our team's forecasting exercise next week? Um, obviously, I can't like really embed her in performance review cycles, things like that, with H, which are super HR friendly. But I would consistently think about how can Gia learn things that can let her do the job before she gets the job? And if I can identify activities like that, I think those are tactical things you can maybe plug people into. So I would I would start with that kind of mindset. Thanks, Mark. Gia, what, what strategies have you utilized or seen be effective? Well, first, Mark, I'm flattered for the position in the Emerging Leaders Program. So excited. Uh, I think <laughs> that, that is one I've actually seen be really effective. A uh, fun fact for my, my previous boss in healthcare, he was a physician who did the organization's Emerging Leaders Program for physicians who wanted to transition into administrative type of roles, leadership type of roles. Physicians certainly never received leadership training throughout their education. So then this was a perfect positioning for him to become the chief medical officer. I believe it was just the following year after that program. So big, big plus to uh, emerging leaders programs as being effective. I think the other thing to keep in mind as we consider these programs and how can we really engage with our population of people who are seeking that next challenge. Maybe they're a little bit bored in their current role. We can look at our survey data to help identify where those populations are. One of my favorite things to do is to look at what we use as our, our commitment-based question. Do you see yourself here in two years time? And look at that by performance rating because it creates a really interesting pattern. For a lot of our folks who are meeting expectations, they generally say, yes, I see myself here in two years time. And that often relates to my workload is accomplishable. I'm capable of logging off at the end of the day. I'm doing the things I need to do to keep my job. But just like Mark was outlining, I'm not doing those things that just define a new standard that really set the organization up for future success. And those are those exceeds or sets new expectations types of ratings. But that group of people is often the group that is most looking to leave the organization. And it's because it's not sustainable to do all of this work without some type of promise, without some type of psychological contract from the organization that we will reward you somehow for this. So that's sometimes the, the secret side factor of those tangible strategies is we can't just give our people more work and say, it's gonna come one day, sweetie, just hang tight. We need to then also say, and here's what we're going to do to recognize that contribution in the meantime. We can't promote you, but maybe there's a raise that comes with taking on this specific project that we know is going to take a year or two to complete. And finding those other strategies that make it more than just verbal praise plus more work to be actually sustainable, I think is a really, really important piece that organizations sometimes miss in how they're trying to keep their top performers without formally promoting them. Yeah. I love that, Gia, and how we can use HR data and HR metrics or engagement data to um, inform our strategies. Carmen, what would you add to that? Yeah, I mean, these are fantastic points. And I think to add to that, I think there's a lot of kind of systemic and structural ways that organizations and people in culture teams and learning and development teams can start to shift their view as well, because I think we need to start to redefine what career progression actually means. Um, and so can we start to talk more about, you know, 
skill acquisition, uh, cross-functional projects like we've been mentioning, um, lateral moves, lots of other different programs that we can instill. But it's not just shifting this mentality, uh, but it's also really communicating them. Because I think what happens a lot of times is there might be these kind of uh, programs in place, but employees might not even know about them. Or maybe it's not you know, spoken about in onboarding or the manager doesn't mention it. So how can we really ensure that we're clearly communicating these opportunities to our employees? Um, and that will really ensure this kind of long-term success of these programs too. Um, and I also think, and we've touched on this already, is you know, Gia, you were mentioning this, the psychological safety and the psychological contract aspect, you know, we as companies and teams need to create a, a culture and an environment where employees actually feel safe to take risks, they feel safe to take on new projects or join a program without the fear of negative consequences, right? Without the fear of, oh, are you now not performing your job to your fullest because you're taking on other side projects or you're, oh, you're spending more time with this other manager or this other team. So it needs to be something that's embedded in the culture in a safe way um, and in a way that we encourage this open dialogue and it's something that's encouraged, not you know discouraged essentially. Um, and again, I know I keep saying this, but we really, really need to train and empower our managers to have these conversations effectively. Um, so how can we start to have one-on-ones where we continuously talk about continuous learning, about learning and development. It's not a nice to have, but it must be part of the agenda. It must be part of those of those one-on-ones as well. Um, and lastly, I think a big part is how do you involve the employees themselves in the programs, right? Because oftentimes, sometimes we're like, oh, you know, this is a nice program or this is a nice L&D initiative for, for people to grow. But do they actually want that? You know, back to Gia's point about measuring and, and getting this data, can we create maybe focus interviews or focus groups to find out, you know, Mark, what do you really want, you know, to grow and develop in the company? Deborah, what would you really enjoy or what motivates you um, rather than kind of creating a cookie cutter approach um, to, to these strategies as well? Because I've seen that sometimes in companies where it's kind of imposed, but we never actually asked our employees, you know, what's actually useful? What's motivating? So yeah, a few more, a few more ideas there. Um. I'd love to hear from you all around, have you leveraged things like um, leadership in ERGs or volunteering in the community or taking on leadership roles in professional associations as a part of an overall growth and development plan? Um, Mark, do you have any examples of where you've seen that be successful, maybe where it's not been successful? would love to hear a little bit more about uh, other ways to get growth and development. So um, I think my headline for this is it can be very helpful and useful for people that are motivated by that kind of work. So uh, frankly, I think Carmen's very last point sort of subtexts this very well. If this is something that gives someone energy if being involved in an ERG or a a group like this, if this provides them extra energy, then yes, I believe it will spark personal professional growth. I do not think companies should require or look at them as check the box activities to be considered for X. I don't think uh, whether or not I should be considered to be a, uh, promoted, uh, like my inclusion in RG should allow me to be better positioned than Gia or Carmen. I think my performance and my deliverable based on expectations of my role, like that's first, foremost, second most. Um, like whether or not I want to be a part of associations like associations like this should be a personal decision, not a reflection of performance in company decision. So it, it's a similar thing to like, I'll go back to the emerging leader program. Like programs like that, yes, I believe they should send signals for people that are eligible or are intrigued by people leadership. I do not believe they should be prerequisites for people leadership. There are many people that don't go into programs like that, maybe that have had previous experience in leadership that already know that they want to go there. They've done it before. They took a little sidestep to come to this company. Like they don't, they don't need that program to potentially be a better candidate than people in that program. So to me, again, I'm, I'm reiterating Carmen's last point. I think it's very important to understand what is important and valuable to those people. And that's where it caters. My last point is like, uh, or the last point that I, I think it sidesteps this this conversation, but um, 
the understanding the individual motivation of your people can never be more important. Like as a, as a father of a 10 and seven year old, um, I love when people present me with additional things I can be a part of or stretch opportunities. I love this opportunity to be part of this webinar. Um, but the reality is like the last thing I really want in my life right now is an extra meeting or an extra stretch opportunity versus five years ago when the kids were super young or before the kids, I would have, I'd take all of them, sign me up. You want me to fly to San Diego and deliver something for three days done. Now it's no, I got softball practice. Like I don't want to take this on. I've got to drive so-and-so to Taekwondo. Like, so what personally motivates me now versus what's going to motivate me in four years when one of them's driving are dramatically different. So, um, I think HR and for the most part should constantly be inspiring people to make that instant, that communication, that personal connection. Um, and then you can sort of figure out, you know, what community is right for them, what, what stretch is right for them. Mm -hmm. Gia or Carmen, would you like to add to that? I want to add two things. One, I completely agree that our ERGs or emerging leader programs shouldn't be a prerequisite you have to complete to be considered for a role. But I wanna add a little gray area that if you're looking at someone who has successfully, for example, led people in a previous organization who's pursuing a people, leader, a people leadership job, but then also looking at someone who has experience leading people in an ERG, in a community organization, something like that, that experience shouldn't be discounted either. We shouldn't just ignore that non-traditional route to leadership roles or to those promotions that aren't leadership roles because then it really firmly closes the door and it becomes this Ouroboros of, if you haven't yet had leadership experience, you can't get leadership experience. So then we only get the people who've been leaders. So I wanna make sure that we keep those alternative routes in mind, but agree they shouldn't be the only way to get there. And then just want to share a, an additional uh, agreement with what Mark was saying around, it's all about our life phases too. When I first started working in my 20s, my boss at the time was a great role model for community engagement. That was her passion. And I became passionate about it because of how she role modeled that. I got involved in so many things that it seemed like every night I had something, but I was single in my 20s, childless. I had no responsibilities outside of going to work, and then going to these community events. It was so much fun. In my 30s now, I'm married. I have aging parents. I have other priorities. So mm. telling me to go get that experience in these non-traditional routes isn't really going to work for me in terms of how I want to pursue my career goals. I want that to fit in the box of work more traditionally. And sometimes we, we expect a lot of people who really want to do the job very, very well, but don't want to give that 10 hour day, they really want it to be that eight hour day. Thanks, Gia. Carmen, anything you wanna to add to that? I think, yeah, I mean, it's super interesting the discussion that we're having and I, I'd love to add, you know, what I see in, in the people builders community um, that I'm managing is, is exactly this, right? You know, some people are joining um, just out of curiosity and wanting to be a part of a community and others are really joining because they want to find mentors or want to have these stretch opportunities or they might join the ambassador program because they want to host events whether that's locally um, or virtually so I, I do see kind of on the other side you know what people are doing to get more of those skills um, and I think it's also creating a rise in this kind of generalist role, right? That we're starting to see more of this fractional career. I know that's deviating, deviating a little bit about the conversation, but I do think that that is interesting because when perhaps we lack certain opportunities, we start to search for them elsewhere. Um, but again, it depends on where we are in our, in our life and what priorities we have um, and also how our manager, yeah, encourages or discourages that because I think that's really really that's such a big big part of it like you said Gia you know your manager was role modeling this so if they're not role modeling that which route do you do you choose thanks Carmen um I have a question for the panelists that we didn't prepare for so just giving you a heads up on that um my question is how are you seeing employees approach to this be similar or different post-pandemic? I want to be first to answer here because I was in healthcare during the pandemic. So just have a slightly different lens on what happened. 
Um, and also I was leading at least one, if not a couple of those young professional groups at that time. In 2020, I became president of our Phoenix Children's Hospital's young professional group. And my goal at the start of 2020 looked very different from my goal in May of 2020 for what is this group going to do? And we saw initially a really big cling to these groups. People wanted that community. It was how they were still getting it, even if it was all virtual or just in a really non-traditional route. But then as things became a little bit more normal, people started going back into the office a little bit more or just the, the expectations reverted back to where we were in 2019 or maybe even higher expectations for what we did at work. A lot of people pulled back from those community involvement opportunities. And we've seen it even in things like webinars and what people sign up for. Pre-pandemic, things would be about a 50% show up rate, thereabouts, maybe just under, but close to 50% of those who signed up would show up. Now we're operating at about a 20% show up rate for those who sign up versus show up. So there is a really big difference in how much people are willing to do things outside of their standard work expectations, as well as outside of the standard work day for how people are approaching those. So that's my first hand lived experience. I know it applies to at least what we saw here in Arizona and maybe others have seen similar patterns. Yeah, Carmen or Mark, what have you seen? I can jump in if you want. I think we were both there. <laughs> um, yeah, I think two interesting patterns. One is since the pandemic in the kind of maybe a year or two ago, we saw the rise of quiet quitting which I think is very interesting and a direct consequence of promotions not being available or you know companies cutting costs, layoffs, et cetera. So I think we saw a response from employees saying, oh, wait a minute, I'm you know disposable because there's lots of layoffs happening or I'm not being promoted and I and I feel that I deserve to be promoted. And so there was this this interesting rebalancing of of how much I give to the company versus you know what I what I get back and perhaps that ties into what you were saying Gia maybe I'm not going to join those extra events or you know stretch myself because for what what's the point if I'm not actually getting anything out of it right perhaps and and then I also think that we're starting to see with this is what I've noticed recently is because there have been so many layoffs actually I think people want to get as many promotions as they can whilst they're in the company. It's like, get the most out of the company whilst I'm there. I don't know when this is going to be ending, perhaps. Um, what's in it for me? Exactly, exactly. And so I think that's perhaps why the expectation to be promoted has increased um, over time rather than decreased because it's like, well, you know, I'm going to have to go somewhere else anyway. So I'd rather go on a higher, on a higher position or have a more senior role, et cetera. So I think it's been an interesting consequence of the the uncertainties of the pandemic, and we're still I think we're still kind of in that, to be honest. Um, but yeah, Mark, go for it. <laughs> so fascinating. Uh, so I have a slightly counterpoint to your last one, but I'll I'll share a couple I'll share a couple of thoughts. So I've seen some companies do a very good job at shifting a narrative and a mindset to embrace like senior leaders to um, create a culture of. Uh, be patient for titles, but be impatient for learning. Like this sort of mindset, this like, I want to transform within skills and I need to understand that it has to be disconnected to titles just based on availability and, and cadence in which they're happening. So it's a big mindset shift. I think some leadership teams do a good job of it. I think, you know, some regardless of, of the sentiment, sometimes it falls flat. Um, but I think that that's probably one that um, companies that have seen slowed growth when it comes to vertical nature of, of organizations, like that's a good mindset. Um, I've seen, we've seen across many tech companies that I've worked with and um, and just across many industries, I've seen exactly what Gia said uh, and, and the call out here from Jamie in the chat, like involvement in optional, optional events and optional things, whether it's emerging leader programs, um, webinars, all of that dramatically decreased. Uh, I also think like the return to office stuff has, has impacted a lot of that where, um, you know, companies are still like, for the most part, I mean, there are some companies that have mandated it, which I think has created its own set of challenges, but the ones that are highly recommending it, 
you still see massive light light attendance. Um, and then some companies are trying to like pivot that by like holding back promotions or vertical opportunity to only people that are in office spaces when um, a certain like contingency of have they've left and they're not coming back, right? So I think a lot of that stuff influences it. Uh, my counterpoint to Carmen, which um, again, I've seen in pockets, but I've seen the reverse with some people that are afraid to push themselves towards promotion in the fear of if I climb to a certain rank, I become on that row that gets deleted one day. So like if I'm the middle manager or I move up to it, do I then become like an overlap, right? Like, I mean, we've seen a lot and the layoffs and things have slowed over the last six months, but during like that 12 month window where it's like, you couldn't open up a, a social feed without seeing someone laying off a bunch of people. It was always those certain levels, right? Where it's like, well, you know, directors can handle that team. We don't need that senior manager anymore. So there, I, I saw a lot of people that were afraid to be like, do I really want to be promoted from an MR3 to an MR4? Knowing that so-and-so just cut the MR4 line. <laughs> um, so, I mean- I think there's two sides of that one. Yeah. I'm seeing a lot of uh, comments in the chat about the use of stay interviews. And Gia, you mentioned the commitment question. What are other ways that you're seeing uh, HR professionals try to get a handle on some data around what employees want and need? Any thoughts about that? Yeah, I can start because this is literally my whole job as a people scientist with CultureAmp. I get to look through this data and say, hey, this is what's important. Um, so that that commitment question is one piece. And I know I saw in the chat as well information about how, how could we do this if it's an anonymous survey. It's still possible to look at it in aggregate if we're including key demographic pieces of information. For example, department, tenure is often really useful. And then that performance rating information, like I was saying, we can load all of that in still as an anonymized survey, but we're able to then say, wow, within GIA's department, things are going really well or things are going really poorly. <laughs> Let's follow up there. And that's really what we're looking for in that pattern of results. Where are those hot spots that are, things are going really great so that we can maybe partner that leader with someone else to peer mentor? How do we develop this environment that you've managed to achieve? But also so that we can do some leading interventions on maybe it's a pay issue that's coming out from the survey of this one department hasn't seen a meaningful raise in four years. And in fact, new people are actually making more than the people who've been here. Some of that comes out in surveys as well, whether it's in comments, whether it's in the literal data that we're collecting. So those are the big picture places I like to start. But we can also look at our learning and development questions that we ask of our employees. We could have those targeted just to leaders if we wanted to know how is this program meeting leaders' needs. We could then know that by leadership level. In my previous organization, we offered a leadership development program that was for every leader, but it was really most useful for this niche spot of, I've been a leader for a little bit, but not for five years. Everyone who'd been a leader for 10, 15 years said, this is basic. What do I need to be doing here? Um, so finding those mismatches can also come out of data too, because we'll see a pattern as well of, if I'm an individual contributor, I love our learning and development programs. If I'm a VP, I hate our learning and development programs. And it could just be that we're not designing them for the appropriate level in the organization. That's my spiel from literally looking at all of this data for many companies. Please, Mark and Carmen, chime in with anything you have. I can chime in as well. Um, I guess, um, taking it a step deeper than than the data as well once we once we have that right can we dig even deeper right so what what exactly are people looking for what what do they need um and then perhaps some focus interviews or whatever way we can we can start to to find that out as well um but i think another important aspect in terms of uh, measurement and data like you were mentioning gia is are the things that we're implementing actually um being uh in, like are we actually implementing them essentially and is the response you know positive so not just measuring you know we're uh, launching this specific program but actually um, do people want this is it working do people feel that it is replacing let's say in a way this this promotion expectation 
Um, but I think, you know, taking it even further, can we start to look at maybe skill assessments? So, you know, beyond organizational data, can we look at individual data? You know, what kinds of skills do we have in the business? A lot of times we don't even know, you know, how multifaceted and multi-talented our employees are because we kind of pigeonhole them into one role with certain tasks. But it turns out, you know, that they have lots of other different talents and lots of other skills. So can we start to assess their skills and um explore that more more holistically in a sense um and then also interests it could be you know that you have interests that are way beyond anything that i could imagine as a manager or as a as an organization so i think it's it's really finding out um who who is in our team what kind of interests do they have what kind of skills and then building building on that as well um and then also i think creating essentially maybe a database of what projects do we have, what assignments are there within the organization, and can we start to map people um, you know, across departments, not just specifically in one department, but can we start to map the appropriate skills that we have in the business with the projects that are ongoing? Um, but yeah, Mark, did you want to add to that too? Yeah, I, I have very little, I mean, look, both those answers were extremely more intelligent than anything I'm about to say. So I'm just going to, I'm going to embrace, embrace everyone. She has got the data. Carmen has way more strategy. Um, my thoughts are like, when you're designing any sort of program related to any of these topics, like what does actual success for this look like, right? I mean, like if you're looking to like in, increase like job satisfaction or like, I don't know, measure like inspiration for people, like that's such a personal thing. Like, um, you know, you get me on a survey where something went wrong personally, or my daughter had a bad day at softball or uh, like, I don't know, my, my response could be very skewed. Right. Or like what I want in life, all that stuff is varied. When I think about, um, like I'll give an example. So for my, my emerging leader program that, that we run here, at, uh, that we run at LinkedIn, what I always found interesting is we have two very interesting um, success metrics that we look for at the end of the program. And it's at the end of the program, it's an exploratory program. So again, it's not this prerequisite into, but at the end, can someone soundly say, I'm more clear that leadership is something I want to go into or not? There's also the middle question where like, I'm still not really sure. I still want to explore. I would love the, if you told me 30% of the people were like, wow, I learned a lot and I know leadership ain't for me. Like that to me is a massive success. Um, even though you're like, wait, but it was a leadership development program. Like, shouldn't we be inspiring people to move into leadership? Like that's what the program is defined as. And it's like, no, we've defined success as, the last thing we want is the high performing IC to move into leadership, realize they hate it and they suck at it. I mean, the, the cost on that is massive. You all, everyone on this call knows that. So I think when it comes to any initiative, can you be really clear on like what you think success is? I think the data that Gia shared um, will help you like get there. And I think the strategy and tactics that Carmen shared, but I, so I just would be like succinct based on what you're trying to do. Yeah. Hey, Mark, uh, since you work a lot with sales and sales leadership, one of the questions that Brooke had in the chat is how do you coach mentor develop people who tell you that they are only motivated by money? I would say good. Congratulations. You are one of 95%. Of, I mean, um, look, no one's only motivated by money. Like it's just, it's just, uh, first of all, it's a, that's a, that's a limiting belief and or a lie. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll laugh. I'll share a 30 second story. I'm going to do this really fast. Uh, and then I'll open it up because I'd love to hear Gia and Carmen's two cents. So I was that guy. My first job out of college, I sold copy machines. Fascinating gig. My manager asked me, like, what's my goal? Like, what do I want to accomplish? And I said something like, well, I want to be in the top 10% of the leaderboard. I want to make club. I want to go on that fancy trip. This is what I want. She then asked me the question. She goes, cool. So when you get that $10,000 bonus, when you hit your objective for Q1, what are you going to buy with it? And I was like, huh? She's like, yeah, what are you going to buy with that bonus? Like, what's what's the first thing you're going to bonus? Now, again, Mark, where you, uh, I'm like 18 months out of college. And I said to her, I probably the most inappropriate thing I could say, but I was like, you know, I'm going to buy a bed. And she's like, huh? She's like, you're going to buy a bed. I'm like, yeah. Like, I still had like a twin size. I know you can all tell on video that I'm a big guy, right? I'm 6'3", 245. Like, I'm a big dude. I still had my like twin size bed that my parents gave me that I brought home from college. And I'm living in an apartment with my friend. And like, my legs hang off the end of it. 
And I was like, yeah, I'm buying a queen size bed. Like I need a legit bed. Like this is what I'm buying. <laughs> and she was like, okay, like sounds good. The next day I come to the office. So again, we're 2003, 2004. So I'm sitting in my old school cube. I'm making cold calls and I walk into the office and I have four brochures from big box stores with mattress sections pinned to my wall. And every one-on-one -on -one moving forward for the next months, my boss would just jokingly say, hey, we ready to buy that bed yet? Fast forward six months, I didn't hit quarter my first quarter. I hit it my second quarter. I buy that bed. I send a horribly inappropriate photo of myself in a bed to my boss. I didn't get fired. I know <laughs> HR is frowning upon this. But like, yes, I told her I was motivated by money. I told her I was motivated by winning the trip because I am. We all are. Every single one of you on this call is, is in some way, shape, or form driven by money and taking care of yourself, but that's not what's motivating you, right? I was motivated to grow up and get away from my parents' stuff. So like my advice would be like invest in coaching, invest in understanding how to gain trust with your people and inspire like leaders and all of you to have those deeper conversations because, you know, does money buy you satisfaction? Does it uh, allow you to send your kids to sleep away camp? Does it like whatever, like there's a, re you know, you're doing something with it and that ultimately is what motivates you. So I think the skill of getting sales leaders to get beyond the numbers and learn how to be coach like, like that, that, that would be my two cents. Yeah. Great. So um, we've got about 15 minutes left or so, uh, and we're going to take about five of that to uh, ask if there are questions from uh, the participants and uh, Barbara, are we able to have people come off mute or do they need to put their question in the chat? I know that Betty had a question maybe 20 minutes ago. And so um, either put that in the chat or um, unmute yourself. I'm pretty sure it has to be chat. I'm pretty sure. Okay. All right. There's a cute uh, box. That that's the easiest way for us to keep track of all of those questions. One of the questions that was uh, on, we talked about the one about motivating it by money. Uh, there's There were a couple of questions really early on about, um, do you believe in leveraging um, competency models? Uh, I haven't heard about competency models in a few years, but are you still using those in your organization? Do you use those to guide growth and development opportunities for people? I can, I can chat to that. Um, yes, at Oyster we use competency models and they are a big part of the performance process. And I think, I think what it does, it really allows to have structure um, and fairness in terms of the process because if we are promoting people, um, well, what is what is the basis of that promotion, right? Where, where did it come from? Is it because I like this individual or is it because they're scoring very highly on all the competencies that are important for this specific role? Um, however, what can be frustrating as an employee is if you are scoring super highly on all the competencies and you're you know, a fabulous you know, individual contributor in all the different areas, and you're told that you're not getting a promotion, regardless of those, you know, exceeding expectations scores that you might be getting. That's when we start to reach those challenges that we've been talking about today, right? So I think competency models allow for a lot of um, systemic structure, but we need to also know how to apply them in a case where we're not actually giving those promotions. And that's, you know, where, what we've been chatting about today. So I think in tandem with other strategies, it's useful. And in that same vein of competency models, the other caution I would give is don't make it a 25 item list of competencies. We need it to be bite-sized, something that someone could look at really on one page, on one screen to then understand these are the things that are expected of my job. Because the longer that list is, the less clear for the employee it is on what do I need to be working on? Well, I have these five things that are going well, but I have five things that are middle. Is it actually these five things that are really, really low ratings for me, but I don't do them very often because my job doesn't require them daily. So keep that list succinct to have it be the most successful in building a competency model. 
Great. And so, uh, Gia, uh, I would ask you and anyone else who's online, someone asked what's a good commitment question to put on a survey. So if you'll put that in the chat, that would be really, really helpful. Um, I think the last uh, question before we go to our wrap up is what is HR's role and what is manager's role in having these conversations with um, employees, um, you know, where, and where does coaching and um, guidance come into play? Um, Mark, would you like to maybe speak to that first? Then we'll we'll go to Carmen. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'll give my two cents, and I'm happy to address Emily's question as well uh, if we have time after this one. Um, I, I think it's I think it's a collaboration. I think um, I think HR in many ways has to be like the behind the scenes engine and collaborative partner to ensure leadership is equipped with the proper way to have these, these conversations in as compassionate of a way as possible. I think the, the manager owns the relationship with the employee and for the most part has to be the deliverer of it. Um, I think if they, if, if, if both partners are not synced up, uh, I think disaster is set up. So I, I think it is a, a full-blown collaboration in every definition of it. Yeah, just to add to that, Mark, I think what often happens in companies is we put all the responsibility of development on HR. And so it's like, oh, it's not my problem. You know, that that's what HR is dealing with. They deal with the people. But like you said, Mark, it is a collaboration. HR might be producing the structures or the systems or the training, for example, but ultimately, it is up to the manager to know their employee employees, you know, very, very well to be able to help guide them and help coach them into what kind of strategies or programs they might be suitable for. So, it, yeah, it, it needs to be from both sides. Absolutely. Was there a question in the chat, Mark, that you wanted to respond to? Oh, I uh, what did Emily have here? Um, thoughts on flat organizations and way to motivate people when there's not like a vertical Climb. I think I captured that correct. Especially flat organizations were much touched. So <clears throat> again, I, it goes back to my a similar answer I had earlier, which is like understanding people's personal um, motivations, right? So, like, what 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 does your employee get joy out of? Do they want to teach others how to do things? Can you identify like forums or an all hands where they can share successes that other people can leverage? Um, are they inspired by being thought of? positively and well within the company so are there like branding um, opportunities for them uh, do they want to teach new enroll employees and are they motivated by helping a new hire um, you know climb the ranks so I, I think it's it's very individualized based on like what someone is motivated by so my again my cliche answer would be step one understand truly what someone is inspired by and then try to see if you can identify opportunities across the organization um i think there's i mean we probably could come up with a list of 15 or 20 different things to consider but i think it's all individualized based on what someone's interested in and the one thing i'd add in that space is just not being confined by the traditional we pay you to reward you pto can be rewarding as a motivating factor if that's something that the company can do in a sustainable way or summer Fridays or finding those other approaches um, to really recognize and reward, even if we can't do it literally financially with a paycheck can be another motivating uh, aspect. Great, thank you. Uh, so Barbara, I'm gonna ask you to bring up the organizational slides. And I'd love for each person to highlight what's special about your organization and one free or low cost growth and development opportunity. So Culture Amp. Hey, perfect. So Culture Amp is really best known for our survey platform in terms of our engagement surveys among many others, but we also offer tools in development and performance that are very beneficial for organizations. We found all of our work and all of our, our tools in people science. It's what we really use as the secret sauce behind, behind the scenes. And we really focus on how can we bring about behavior change in organizations. 
What you can see on the screen here are the different resources, information that we take in from others. So we work with over 7,000 companies across 79 different countries with 1 million plus different reviews completed, 8 million plus surveys completed, 3,000 benchmarks. So all of that to say, we have a lot of data and a lot of stuff that we use to then inform the tactics that we recommend and the changes that we recommend in organizations. So that's what we do as Culture Amp, Ooh, a bite size, a, a doable learning and development opportunity. Who boy, that would be, I really like the idea of bringing people into more job shadowing opportunities. Mark mentioned it to really start things off where if you wanna be a people leader, could you shadow your people leader and then start taking on a meeting here or there as a leadership role? Maybe I know I don't wanna be a people leader, but I'm intrigued by this role that's somewhere else in the organization that I've never actually seen. Can I shadow that? Can I get the exposure? Because that gives us that runway that an emerging leader style program would give to someone who's trying to get to that people leader role for anyone who's not necessarily looking to make that uh, more traditional move in the organization. Thanks, Gia. Carmen. Yes. So um, Oyster, we are a global employment um, solution. So we offer compliance and automated hiring and deep local intelligence. Um, and we're not just a platform in itself for global employment, but we're also a trusted partner in helping you succeed in your global employment journey. Um, and we essentially can mitigate risks with uh, this compliant infrastructure in 180 plus countries worldwide. Um, and we also enable you to access kind of deep local intelligence on different countries, insights and tools to guide you through the, all the stages of global employment. Um, and we also offer you, you know, design and rollout of kind of these offers on local insights to help you win and retain top talent as well. Um, and I think I will, I will do a shameless plug of, of the people builders community here as well, because I think that's a great um, way to offer learning and development opportunities to people in a in a free way and in an engaging way. So um, some of our employees are invited to um, host workshops with us, whether that's, you know, virtually or online for folks that really want to increase their, you know, maybe public speaking abilities or hone in on a specific subject. Um, but we also have newsletters and resources and we have folks from Oyster helping create those resources for the community as well. Um, so it's really gathering people that maybe have nothing to do usually with community or this more kind of marketing aspect and then enabling them to to yeah learn new skills or you know uh, put themselves out there and um yeah really put themselves out there and stretch themselves in terms of you know what they can learn and how they can grow so yes great thank you so mark and i are coaches at bravely and bravely is a coaching and training platform uh that really gives on-demand coaching to a wide range of employees within the company. Uh, you see some of the companies that we partner with, uh, Pinterest, Zillow, et cetera. Uh, but it's a great op uh, opportunity to extend your HR organization's reach to many levels inside of the company. Um, so if you're looking for a training and coaching resource, definitely plan to find out a little bit more about Bravely. And I think we have one final um, uh, slide. This one is if you need HRCI credit or SHRM credit, uh, those are the codes that you can use for that credit. And um, Barbara, do you want to put up the last poll? I wanna really thank everyone for participating today. We certainly hope that you've learned something and that you've got at least one nugget of a takeaway. Um, and one of, I would conclude by saying, one of the ways that I really encourage people to get involved is through community engagement. And that is really important when people are feeling isolated working at home or they've moved to a new city and they don't know anyone. So that's a great way for development. Thank you guys, everybody for participating today. Have a wonderful Thursday afternoon, morning, evening, depending on where you are in the world.
And we really appreciate you spending an hour with us.